Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I am your host, Heather Tusco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. So the Tudor dynasty was, of course, marked by intrigue, power struggles, and transformation. And key figures behind the scenes, as we've seen, often had considerable influence. Among these, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley stand out, not only for their loyalty to Henry VII, but the widespread unpopularity they garnered. Historians like Polydor Virgil saw them as extortioners, which was basically the public sentiment at the time. However, their actions were endorsed by the king, so they were loyal servants, they would claim. As crucial advisors to the king, their actions would set the stage for political maneuverings at the dawn of Henry VIII's reign. So that's what we're talking about today. But before we get started, you guys, TudorCon is less than two weeks away. So if you want to come and grab your spot for the streaming ticket, you're running out of time. <laughs> so the address, I know I say this all the time, englandcast.com slash TudorCon online. Three days of tutor immersion, all kinds of talks, um, a tutor cook-along video, a tutor musical. It's going to be a weekend of just tutor immersion. So englandcast.com slash tutorcon online for the streaming ticket because, of course, in-person ticket sales have closed. Also, a big shout out and thank you to a couple of my newest patrons, Catherine, Paula, Kim, Deanna, Dina maybe? as well as Bernice and Bobby. Thank you so much for supporting the Renaissance English History Podcast. Patrons get extra episodes, chats with authors, um, all kinds of cool stuff. So if you would like to learn more about how you can support the show for as little as a dollar an episode, go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash Englandcast to become a supporter. All right, let's get into it. We're going to start with the backgrounds and rise to power for both Richard Empson and for Edmund Dudley. So Richard Empson was born in Northamptonshire. He rose from relatively modest beginnings to becoming one of the most influential figures at Henry VII's court. His early life provided little indication of the heights that he would reach, making his ascendancy all the more remarkable. His career began in the legal profession, a path that provided him with the tools he needed to navigate the political intricacies of the court. As a trained lawyer, he held various posts. He was the Speaker of the House of Commons in 1491 and 1497. His legal acumen caught the eye of Henry VII, who wanted to strengthen the crown's financial position and suppress the powers of the overmighty subjects. Of course, Henry VII was in this position where he needed money. He needed to consolidate his power. And so in that environment, Empson thrived. His role was pivotal in implementing Henry's fiscal policies, particularly the notorious system of bonds and recognizance. He was also associated with the Council Learned in Law, and he had a role in selling offices, wardships, and various other permissions, which would bring significant revenue to the crown. These policies would lay the foundation for both his influence and, of course, the discontent directed towards him. The Dudley name was not new to English politics, and, of course, it would continue on through the 16th century. Edmund Dudley entered the scene as a descendant of an established noble family. His lineage traced back to the barons of Dudley, ensuring that he was well-placed from birth to make a mark on English history. His early years were characterized by a solid education, he was grounded in the legal profession, similar to Empson, and that paved his way for entry into the political realm. By 1497, he was a member of Parliament for Lewis, and he soon became the Speaker of the House of Commons. His position of prominence was solidified when he became a leading member of the King's Council. Henry VII quickly recognized Dudley's capabilities. Together with Empson, he was tasked to manage the crown's finances, a responsibility that he took on with zeal. The methods he employed, they were effective in filling the royal coffers, but they often bordered on extortion, making him a deeply divisive figure among the nobility. His meticulous records and account books showed his dedication to the crown's fiscal health, 
They also highlighted the ruthless efficiency which he, alongside with Amson, executed these duties. This combination of lineage and capability made Dudley indispensable to Henry VII, but would also sow the seeds of his eventual downfall. It's interesting that while he was imprisoned in the Tower later, Dudley actually penned a petition to Richard Fox and Thomas Lovell detailing individuals that he thought were unjustly treated. He highlighted numerous bonds which Henry used more as behavioral guarantees for debtors than for actually demanding payment. Dudley was adamant that Henry was the architect of this policy, and additionally, during his confinement, he wrote a treatise on government and society called The Tree of Commonwealth. So that's interesting. So let's talk about their relationship with Henry VII. Henry VII, of course, effectively established the Tudor dynasty. And in that history, it's impossible to overlook this partnership of Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. As his chief instruments in consolidating royal power and fiscal strengthening, their partnership became synonymous with the late king's reign. From the outset, both Empson and Dudley exhibited unwavering loyalty to the crown. Their shared ambition to uplift the monarchy's stature and ensure its fiscal stability meshed seamlessly with Henry VII's broader objective of centralizing power. The king rose to the throne after the tumultuous Wars of the Roses, and he understood the necessity of a strong centralized government. He saw in Empson and Dudley the perfect enforcers of this vision. Central to their partnership was the controversial yet effective system of bonds and recognizances. These were essentially financial securities or guarantees that ensured good behavior. While such bonds were not a new concept, under the stewardship of Empson and Dudley, they took on a new dimension. They targeted both the nobility and wealthy commoners, often on very dubious grounds. They extended this practice extensively, using it as a tool to impose heavy fines on those they deemed to have stepped out of line. This system became a two-pronged strategy, a means to control the nobility and other influential figures, and a steady source of income for the crown. Under Henry VII, the court of Star Chamber, a judicial body, saw increased prominence, and Ebsen and Dudley were often at its helm. They employed the court to bypass the regular judicial system, ensuring swift and, more often than not, favorable outcomes for the crown. The Star Chamber became a feared entity with its secretive procedures and the extensive reach of its judgments. Ebsen and Dudley were accused of manipulating its proceedings, to further their objectives and those of the king. They launched investigations, often based on very vague accusations, leading to heavy fines and even imprisonment. This bypassing of traditional legal procedures and the seemingly arbitrary nature of their judgments earned them many enemies. While the Tudor monarchy grew richer, much of the nobility felt squeezed. Empson and Dudley's measures ensured a consistent flow of wealth into the royal treasury, often, of course, at the expense of the English elite. Lands, titles, and wealth were frequently seized under various pretexts, leading to widespread resentment. Their policies also affected trade. Their enforcement of old and forgotten statutes and fines led to unpredictability in the mercantile community. Such actions, while enriching the crown, had a broader economic implication, stifling trade and entrepreneurship for many. By the end of Henry VII's reign, Empson and Dudley had become the faces of the crown's unpopular policies. Their unwavering commitment to strengthening the monarch had achieved notable success. The royal treasury was overfilling, and the nobility's power had been curtailed significantly. However, the means by which they achieved these ends had sown seeds of discontent. The very effectiveness and ruthlessness that made them so invaluable to Henry VII would also make them vulnerable in the subsequent reign. In their quest to solidify the Tudor hold on England, Empson and Dudley had become emblematic of a reign characterized by cunning pragmatism and an unyielding drive for centralization. Empson and Dudley, while undeniably effective in their roles, left a lasting legacy of resentment among various factions in English society. Their unpopularity would eventually lead to their downfall, and it was rooted in a combination of their perceived overreach, 
aggressive financial tactics, and personal ambition that often overshadowed their duties to the crown. Central to their unpopularity was the sense of their overwhelming authority, which seemed to bypass the traditional legal standards that had been in place for centuries. Many felt that they frequently sidestepped established legal procedures in their zeal to fill the royal treasury and curtail the nobility's influence. By utilizing the Court of Star Chamber, for example, they could ensure outcomes favorable to the crown without the traditional checks and balances provided by common law courts. They also were known for interpreting their authority broadly, invoking old or obscure laws to target their adversaries. This approach was seen as a direct threat to the English system of governance, where laws and regulations were expected to be applied fairly and uniformly. The aggressive financial policies employed by Empson and Dudley had a profound impact on the nobility, a class that was traditionally shielded from such intrusions. The system of bonds and recognizances was particularly punishing. Many nobles found themselves under substantial debt to the crown, a situation that they were unaccustomed to and deeply resented. This indebtedness not only affected their financial standing, but also eroded their traditional autonomy and influence. Often, when these bonds were claimed to be defaulted on, Empson and Dudley would not hesitate to seize assets, including land and titles. Such aggressive measures were seen as an affront to the nobility's traditional privileges. And while serving the crown was their official duty, accusations often swirled that they were equally, if not more, committed to their own personal gain. Many believed that the duo exploited their positions for personal enrichment. While the royal treasury undoubtedly benefited from their activities, there were frequent murmurings about the pair pocketing their own share, further alienating those who bore the brunt of their policies. Their rapid rise to power and their close relationship to Henry VII did not sit well with the other courtiers. The English court was a complex web of influence and power, and the meteoric ascent of Empson and Dudley was seen by many as upsetting this balance. Their influence was often viewed with suspicion. Many courtiers felt sidelined, leading to internal strife within the corridors of power. Of course, this would also happen later with Wolsey and Cromwell. So it wasn't an unusual position for one of the king's leading ministers to find themselves in. Their effectiveness and closeness to the king, similarly to Wolsey and Cromwell, made them indispensable, but it also isolated them from broader courtly and societal sentiments, setting the stage for their eventual downfall. The early 16th century, of course, saw the transition in the English monarchy from the cautious and calculated reign of Henry VII to the vibrant and dynamic rule of his son, the young Henry VIII. As the crown passed to a new monarch, the political landscape of England underwent swift and tumultuous changes, directly impacting the careers of Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. Henry VII's death in 1509 marked the end of an era characterized by his meticulous governance and the cultivation of a robust central authority, and his passing signaled a shift in the underlying power dynamics of the English court. Empson and Dudley had flourished under the protective shadow of Henry VII. They suddenly found themselves exposed and vulnerable. Their methods had been deeply unpopular, and Henry VIII, as he's rising in wanting to be his own man and wanting to have a completely different type of reign to his father, was anxious to separate himself from their activities. The English nobility, who had long harbored grievances against the duo, sensed an opportunity. Without the support of Henry VII, they were very vulnerable. So Henry VIII was young and charismatic and a stark contrast to his father. He had a very different temperament and outlook. He had been kept almost, you know, feeling like he was in prison for so many years after Arthur died. He couldn't do anything. Um, his father was so super overprotective of him. He was ready to get out there and be his own man. He wanted to define his own legacy, and he wanted to distance himself from the past. He was also keenly aware of public sentiment, and he quickly looked for ways to distance himself from the more unpopular policies of the previous reign. Empson and Dudley were the most visible symbols of these policies, and so they naturally became focal points of his efforts to curry favor with the nobility and public. The early years of Henry's reign, Henry VIII's reign, were characterized by the rise of new advisors, eager to solidify their positions at court. One of the most prominent during this period was Woolsey, Thomas Woolsey, 
who rapidly rose in influence and power. Woolsey was astute and politically savvy, and he recognized the benefits of targeting Empson and Dudley. By championing their downfall, he could not only further endear himself to the young king, but also appease the broader court and nobility, many of whom harbored deep-seated animosity towards the duo. The subsequent arrests of Empson and Dudley can be viewed not just as acts of retribution, but also as symbolic sacrifices. By holding them accountable, Henry VIII sent a clear message. The unpopular practices of his father's reign would not continue, and he was willing to take decisive action to ensure his reign would be different. Empson and Dudley, once indispensable assets to the crown, quickly became casualties of this change. Their downfall was expedited by a young king's desire to forge his own path and the machinations of emerging power players at the English court. So the charges that were levied against Empson and Dudley were severe treason and conspiracy against the newly crowned king, Henry VIII. These accusations were not only legal indictments, but political weapons. The allegation of treason, of course, the most grievous crime in Tudor England, was particularly potent. It not only rendered Empson and Dudley enemies of the state, but also portrayed them as betrayers of the crown, a narrative that further justified their arrest in the public eye. The trial of Empson and Dudley was as much a piece of political theater as it was a legal proceeding. The cards, of course, were heavily stacked against them from the outset. Despite the accusations, both men mounted spirited defenses. They argued that their actions under Henry VII had been carried out under the directives of the king. And while this was largely true, it did little to sway the sentiments of a court and public hungry for retribution. The proceedings were seen as a foregone conclusion. The weight of the crown and prevailing political climate ensured that the scales of justice were tilted against them. Moreover, public sentiment, influenced by years of their aggressive financial policies, clamored for their punishment. Basically, people wanted their blood, right? And they got it. The grim finale of Empson and Dudley's story was played out on the executioner's block. Their deaths were not just personal tragedies for their families, but were imbued with political symbolism. Historical accounts suggest that both men met their ends with a degree of dignity. Dudley, in particular, is said to have used his final moments to reflect on his deeds and express regret for any unintended wrongs and reaffirm his loyalty to the crown. There was a broader message in their executions, which served a dual purpose. First, it satisfied the demands of the public and nobility that had long viewed them as symbols of Henry VII's overreach, but also it allowed Henry VIII to firmly establish his reign on his terms. Their deaths were a clear message. The old guard was gone and a new era had dawned. Empson and Dudley's fate are a stark reminder of the transient nature of power and favor. Once indispensable to a king, they found themselves sacrificed on the altar of political expediency by his successor. Empson and Dudley's story highlights the double-edged sword of royal favor. On the one hand, their close association with Henry VII brought them unprecedented power, influence, and wealth. But on the other, it made them vulnerable to the capriciousness of the subsequent monarch and the animosities of those they had alienated. Tudor England, with its court intrigues and shifting alliances, was a treacherous landscape. Just ask Cromwell and Woolsey as well. Today's trusted advisor could easily become tomorrow's traitor. Empson and Dudley, at the pinnacle of power under one king, found themselves reviled and condemned under the next. Also, this early execution of Empson and Dudley sort of foreshadowed the tumultuous and brutal nature of Henry VIII's reign. Their deaths were just the beginning in a series of actions that would solidify Henry as one of history's most ruthless rulers. The willingness to eliminate two once-trusted advisors signaled Henry's readiness to remove any perceived threat, no matter how close or how trusted. This propensity for decisive, often brutal action would also become all the more evident with events like the dissolution of the monasteries and the execution of Anne Boleyn. The trajectory of advisors in the Tudor court underwent notable shifts transitioning from Empson and Dudley to figures like Thomas Woolsey and later Thomas Cromwell. Empson and Dudley were primarily enforcers, ensuring the crown's fiscal interests were met. In contrast, figures like Woolsey and Cromwell were more holistic in their approach, balancing domestic concerns with the complexities of international diplomacy and church-state religions. And of course, Woolsey and Cromwell wielded significant power, but they also had dramatic downfalls. 
Woolsey fell from grace due to his inability to secure an annulment for Henry, and Cromwell's reformist zeal ultimately led to his execution. The pattern suggests that regardless of their role or accomplishments, advisors under the Tudors always navigated a precarious path. The lives, careers, and unfortunate ends of Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley are poignant reminders of the unpredictability of life at Tudor court. Of course, Dudley's family would live on, and his grandson, Robert Dudley, would be Elizabeth I's most trusted advisor. So, you know, it would continue on. It didn't completely end with Edmund Dudley. For now, we are going to stop. Hop into the Tudor Learning Circle at tutorlearningcircle.com to discuss Empson and Dudley and all things Tudor. And remember to check out the TudorCon streaming tickets at englandcast.com slash TudorCon online. All right. Thank you so much for listening. And I will be back next week with more stories about Tudor England. Bye-bye. Blow northern wind, ascend for baby sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoort a bird in bower breek, that soul is same leaves on sea. Men's full maiden of me, fair and fresh bond.